Welcome everyone to the Great Minds, Great Spaces speaker series. My name is Christelle Hale. My pronouns are she, her, hers, and I'm so happy that you're out here. There's a wonderful, beautiful faces out here. As always, to the familiar ones in the crowd, I say thank you and welcome back to new faces. I'm excited that you joined us here today, and I am looking forward to seeing you at future events. Yeah. The Division of Talent and Inclusion strives to create and institutionalize spaces like this, where individuals from all over campus can come together and share ideas, passions, questions, and food. Great Minds Great Spaces is aimed and dedicated to working towards infusing themes of diversity, equity, and inclusion into our daily conversations and thought processes. Together, we will learn just how impactful we can be as a community. We'll get started in just a moment, but before we dive in, there are a couple things you should know. One, if you haven't signed in with Bonnie back there, Bonnie, raise your hand, please. Please do so. I think I got mostly everyone in a frantic flurry, but I think um, if you're unsure, that's that go to Bonnie, make sure you sign in. And this is just to keep track of the individuals here, so we always have enough food, enough space, and everything. That's all we need your name for. Second, this event is being recorded for those who may not be able to be present, but still want to engage and participate. If you have any kind of issue with that, please pull me aside and let me know. Not a problem at all. Three, the next right, Great Minds Great Spaces will be Tuesday, March 26th in the 61 Conference Room at our Sports and Recreation Center. Our very own Professor Eleanor Loikana from the School of Business will be presenting. She will be talking about neurodiversity in the high-tech workforce. So, register with me if you'd like to jump ahead to that. We have the Great Minds Great Spaces um, sessions during the lunch hour because we understand that everyone is busy. So, during the session, if you need to get up for more food, or get to your next destination, that is fine. We just ask that you please be respectful of those around you and do so quietly, as much as you can. It's a tight space, so I'm just asking you to do what you can if you need to get to your next place or you need to get to your Yeah? Now, without further ado, I'd like to present our speaker, Drea Finley. Drea Finley is a black feminist scholar and activist born and raised in Buffalo, New York. Drea graduated with a dual degree in sociology and honors in women's studies from Colgate University in 2013. Currently, Drea serves as an administrative dean for administrative advising and the director of first generation program at Colby University. And is in the process of completing their master's degree in cultural foundations of education at Syracuse University. Some of you may best remember them from WPI's LGBTQIA plus history month dinner and panel hosted by the OMA last year. Drea was a panelist and their deep wisdom and reflection reverberates on this campus to this day. So I have to bring them back. Drea lives their life as an openly proud black, queer, and differently abled woman who focuses on holistic interpretations of healing, justice, and radical activism. As a deep intellectual, Drea works to interrogate systems of oppression through community organizing and higher education platforms. With a critical lens of race, class, gender, sexuality, ability, and spirituality, Drea works to model and dismantle notions of respectability politics. Simply put, Drea's life work is devoted to seeing the complete liberation of all people's right to exist and live within the complexities of our intersectional identities. In their words, if, liberation, if my liberation is bound in your liberation, then ultimately we are connected. For when passion meets desire, change happens. Most of all, Drea is a dear, dear friend and mentor to myself and many others, I'm sure. Please join me in giving Drea a WPI welcome. Before I get started, I definitely want to say that, just to break the ice a little bit, um, a few things, right? So first and foremost, I am all the things that Christelle said that I am, so thank you for that, right? I appreciate you being in those spaces and in those ways. But second, I also want to mention more than anything else, I am a facilitator, friends. 
right? So y'all, I am a facilitator, I'm writing, my work is really within intergroup dialogue and bringing together intersections, talking across difference, um, and building platforms in various spaces in those same ways, in those same capacities. And so that is really where my heart of this is. So if you came here today thinking this is gonna be like some formal presentation and I'm throwing this information at you, there will be some of that, but like, let's not do that, right? I think um, a lot of our work, especially within higher ed, is really breaking down, again, right, notions of respectability and what it means to enter spaces and how it is that we would do those things. And so everything that I will say today is extremely intentional, not that it isn't on any other day, but what I will say is that the way in which I am showing up in front of you, to, with, and for you is all by strategic design. And so I might curse a little bit, and I hope you guys okay, right? But also, if we're going to talk about respectability, we also need to talk about what it means to model that in a different capacity as well, right? No better place than now. Um, second thing that I'll also say is at any point, if any of you have any questions, please feel free to stop me. Throw a hand in the air, a signal, anything that you might be able to, that signals to me that um, there is a question that you have, and I will absolutely stop and entertain those questions as we go along. I think when we're talking about respectability politics, we have to ask questions more than anything else. And so if anything, I hope that you will leave this space today with more questions than you have come in with. I don't know that I'll be able to provide all the answers, right, but I'll do what I can. Sound good? Okay, we feeling like family? <laughs> all right, all right, I'm glad that we're there. Um, so first and foremost, let's see, where, where, shall, where shall I begin? So again, hi, my name is Drea, right? My pronouns are they, them, and theirs. It really is an honor to be in front of you and to be with you today. Um, I would tell you right now, there's only like three slides, right? Again, strategic design. Three slides. I'm not a PowerPoint person. I don't know about any of you others, but it is it is my my ability to to reach you. I think in this space is to have a conversation that we should be able to have with one another before anything else. I might start sweating. I got my. I'm a little nappy here. That's okay too, right? Keep going. I feel like a preacher up here. So good. I love you. Um, and so just, just a few things in that same way. And so I'm a little bit curious before we kind of go into this, this topic about negotiating your existence and the intersectionality of respect, respectability politics, of just getting an idea kind of of who is in the room here today um, and essentially of, of why it is that you decided to come or what it is that you might be hoping to gain. Are there any brave souls out there today that might be willing to offer your name, your pronouns, and why it is that you've come today, or any questions that you might have? I'm just curious if there's, just to get a few thoughts. Please. Uh, my name is Therese. I use the she, her, hers pronoun. And um, one thing I really hope I can get from you today is I'm working on this artificial intelligence that is deliberately not racist, that I can prove mathematically and statistically is not racist, and I need to be able to explain this, not just to people who share mathematical proofs and statistical explanations, but to people you know, who are, are affected by a kind of vehicle, society at large. How do I explain, maybe I'm talking across a, a you said that phrase earlier, uh, talking across a, a, a chasm of some kind. Anyway, I need to communicate with people who don't think the same way I do, and I want to do that in a way that is trustworthy and respectful and communicative. And I think you can help me. I know you can help me. All right, I hope so. Thank you. <laughs> Others, anyone else? Please. Uh, I'm pretty sure you can Andy, uh, 
so much for that and, and giving for those that shared and were willing to for helping to open up the space a little bit for us. I do want to provide another disclaimer really quickly. Um, friends, I, I will refer, refer to all of us as friends and family in this room because at this point we're, we're under we're under the same guise together and so that is what we are. The first thing that I will say is that this topic is difficult, it's messy, and it may not feel good. And so, in that same vein, um, it is my hope that you all, each and every one of you will pay attention to your bodies, your hearts, your minds, your souls, and what that may mean in terms of being the ability to take care of yourself. And so whatever that may mean for you, please do so in doing the same ways. Also know that this conversation, this is the start of a conversation. There is certainly not enough time in our little time together um, to go into great, great depths about what respectability really looks like and how it plays out. But I hope that we will begin a conversation that you all may be able to continue to move forward and then be able to find some applicable ways to make some changes in your own personal lives or also to reevaluate and do some of that introspective work within yourselves. To also think about the ways that you may be enacting respectability politics, but also the ways that you also may be internalizing and receiving them in just the same way. Okay? Let's go ahead and get started. This is the first time I moved the clicker, y'all. I'm so excited. <laughs> we begin with one of my favorite quotes. I will read in my very professional orator voice for you. It's okay to laugh with me today. You all, it's okay to have a moment to feel. All of that is welcome in the space and, and demands our greatest attention as well. And so Marion Williamson has said to us, our deepest fear is not that we are inadequate. Our deepest fear is that we are powerful beyond measure. It is our light, not our darkness, that most frightens us. We ask ourselves, who am I to be brilliant, gorgeous, talented, fabulous? Actually, who are you not to be? You are a child of God. Your playing small does not serve the world. There is nothing enlightened about shrinking so that other people won't feel insecure around you. We are all meant to shine as children do. <coughs> we were born to make manifest the glory of God that is within us. It's not just in some of us, it's in everyone. And as we let our own light shine, we unconsciously give other people permission to do the same. As we are liberated from our own fear, our presence automatically liberates others. And I'm just going to let that hang there for a second. And we will return to this as well. And so, the first way that I'm going to ask you to start, like I said, we're going to engage in some interaction. I have one thing that I'm going to ask each and every one of you um, to do with either a small group or a person next to you. I want you to come up with a word or a few words or a small definition of what it is that you think respectability is. Whether that's the notions of respectability politics, what respect in general, but do, do me some time in helping me to understand how you internalize the word respect or respectability politics. I'll give you a really short, right, two to three minutes. Just chat with the person next, with you, next to you or in a small group. And then I will ask to hear just a few of the things you come up with. Conversations, quick definitions, words, phrases, things that come to mind around respectability and respect. Yes, in the past. Um, so one thing that we talked about was that um, for us, that respectability politics was the ways in which you're forced to go against your own nature to appease those who have power over you, whether that be students, but more likely those are in the larger hierarchy of academia. Excellent. Thank you. Other thoughts? Yes. So um, our group spoke a little bit about um, kind of what respect has meant traditionally and also what it should mean. So uh, thinking about um, being in situations where respect kind of has meant to us growing up as something where you um, are not free necessarily to speak, that you're deferring to a higher power or someone with more authority over you, but that it really should be a space where you are able to respect everyone's differences and 
to understand those differences and to have you know um, constructive friction that's no dialogue that is necessary. Thank you. Yes. There's also we kind of talked about the difference between um, respecting a person like just as another person and respecting them as an authority figure. Mm -hmm. One of those kind of moments, but then like respect for the authority figure usually is often tied to like a lot of racist, sexist, homophobic, all those other things, like stereotypes. Absolutely. Thank you. Maybe two others. Yeah. <coughs> we talk about respect as uh, moving from a notion of just purely tolerance of difference mm -hmm. onto valuing difference mm -hmm. as something that might enrich our lives and the lives of those around us. Thank you. I like that. So for those in the room that may be more of our type A's, I've got one slide. <laughs> Respectability politics, right? So let's go ahead and define, and then we'll move into some, some latter interpretations, and then I'm gonna move us into talking a little bit about my experience, and also what that has coupled in terms of intersectional identities as well. And so respectability politics are a continuum of behaviors and attitudes that reproduce dominant norms and strategies for producing a counter-narrative to, excuse me, to a counter narrative to negative stereotypes placed upon oppressed groups. So I'll come back to that to flesh that out a little bit further. And then what we also know is that historically, respectability refers to a set of values embodied by the white middle class that appeal to black American reformers and subsequently other marginalized groups as a tactic for social uplift and mobility. And so within those pieces, what we know is that um, the original term, so respectability politics or politics of respectability, right, was coined by Evelyn Higginbotham, excuse me, 1993. And she states that the politics of respectability described how early 20th century black women presented themselves as polite, sexually pure, and thrifty to reject stereotypes of them as immoral, childlike, and unworthy of respect and protection. And so understanding the history about respectability is, is extremely crucial first and foremost. I am not like a huge history buff person. What I will say though is that through my academic scholarship, I've come to understand the absolutely integral importance of what it means to understand these historical impetus, where it comes from, right? And to also give credence, value, and credit, right? At the end of the day, just credit sometimes to the work in which um, those that have come before us, what they have done. And so this work really comes out of black women who moved through understandings of intersectionality, pushing back, right, in this form of resistance, stating that I will not continue to be policed by an oppressive nature, but also fighting with that, that negotiation of how is it that I will not be policed while still also being policed at the same time, right? And so it's really important to, to mention the tension that exists between those two pieces, because when we talk about negotiating identity, it's often, and especially in terms of intersectionality, one of the things that we often think about is just the moment of the intersection, right? And we're like, okay, I may be black or a person of color, and I also may be queer, or I may consider myself um, with a different ability status. What happens at the moment of the intersection? What I challenge us to think about is that the moment of intersection is absolutely crucial, but there is everything that comes before the moment of intersection and everything that comes there on after as well that has to be critically interrogated. And respectability politics exists on both sides of that intersection, right in the middle, right before, and right after. It is almost as if it is a continuum that continues to play upon one's body, and so there is no stopping point, there is no middle ground, there is this ebb and flow of what it means to keep this negotiation in a fluid-like manner, if you will, in so many ways. And so one of the other things I also add is that respectability in so many ways has two audiences, or historically has been noted to have two audiences, that meaning coming out of, again, black and African American tradition, um, who were encouraged, right? So black folk were encouraged to be respectable, but then it was also white people who needed to be shown, right, 
that African Americans or black folks could be respectable. And so this notion of the white gaze is also something that has to be critically interrogated also at the same time. And so in order for there to be an audience, there must also be a performance, right? And so we can go back, some of us that may be sociology scholars, that's what I'm talking about, right? We'll go back and think about Gottman, right? And, and how it is that we exist in, in two or more spaces, but also what it means to um, show up in those spaces and how it is that you will allow yourself to be seen or not seen, right? In those same various same capacities and ways. And so respectability, it also encompasses messages of class and privilege denoted through things such as dress, organizational affiliations, also behaviors. And so respectability refers to a set of rules embodied by the white middle class that appeal to black Americans as well. And in that same vein, also to other marginalized or those that were deemed or considered to be marginalized groups, and it was as a tactic for social uplift and mobility, right? And so when we talk about that history, there's two negotiations that we also might that we that we also need to consider here on after in this moment. The first being respectability politics are placed upon people, right? They are placed upon bodies, placed upon identities. There is also this notion within respectability politics as well that it is also adopted by those that are coming from the oppressed group or identity. And so what does it then mean for black or brown people, right? People of color. LGBTQ identified folks, right? Mm -hmm. Folks with visible or non-visible disabilities to adopt these same notions around respectability in the same ways that they have, it has also been placed upon our bodies as well. So there's an internalization that comes with that, which we'll talk about in a little while. But I also have to say that there is, there is a sincere regard for a push and a pull it is not as if there is only one person that is placing this upon, there's also an adoption that happens. What I will say though is that the adoption, if I will, in quotes, is also a means of survival, right? And so when you understand that groups, those that come from marginalized backgrounds or spaces are quote unquote, and I use adopting, because that is the language that is really within the scholarship, but when it comes to adopting this narrative in some ways around what it means to be able to, to navigate a respectability politic, you also have to realize that that adoption was, in my, in so many ways, I don't consider it to be an adoption, it is a forced means of survival. Because if you do not adhere, right, to these politics that have been placed upon you, the outcomes can be vast, and usually they are not in your favor. <coughs> we'll some of that in just a few minutes as well. And so, in my experience, let's go back to my little Drea. Right, little Drea is like, you know, coming up in life, little Drea understands that they're brown, right? I will, I'll stop referring myself in the third person. Um, right, so I understand that I'm brown growing up in a white based society. I understand that there's power and that there's privilege that exists. The key being power in those same capacities. Respectability politics only function because there is a perpetuance of power that is still asserted, right, onto one's marginal quote unquote identity that allows the thing to continue. And so if you remove the power out of a piece of it, right, we might have a really different conception of what respectability looks like. But the reality is we are all within this system of dominance, right? We are all within a society that is functioning basically upon the powers of white supremacy. I'm not shy to talking about that or saying that. <coughs> white people also, y'all also do not benefit from white supremacy in the same ways, right? There may be gains within the society that white folks are able to benefit from, but the inherent act of white supremacy itself is a detriment to each and every one of us. And that is something that is important to be noted. That's actually a different, that's a different talk for a different day. So um, let, me, let, me not, let me not get off track here. Um, and so one of the things that we have to think about, I think really, really crucially, so when we talk about the adoption that happens by groups that are coming from these marginal backgrounds or having these quote unquote marginal esque experiences, you have to consider not only about the adoption being something as a means of survival, but you also have to consider that your survival is contingent upon one's ability to also continue to play the game. And so there are rules, right, associated with being able to negotiate that status or being able to do that. And the rules look different in various ways. And so if we're talking about race, 
There are rules associated with how it is that you are to show up, but each of those things may look different depending on the identity that you, that you ascribe to, right? And so black folk, I won't say black and brown, right? I'll do some delineations here. Black folk, right, African-American, Caribbean as folk, those of African descent, are going to have a different realization and understanding of respectability politics than, per se, um, our brothers and sisters or those that may identify in our, in our Asian communities, right? And so when those negotiations around your identity are made to be different, it forces you to have to act differently within them in just the same ways. And so for me, as a young black girl growing up, um, when I entered the academy going into really like my college years, coming into Colgate at the time and things of that nature, um, I found myself struggling all the time with the negotiation of my identity. I, I, couldn't, I couldn't manage. At some days, it was moments I was like, oh, I'm too black today. Oh, I'm too queer today. Oh, I love Jesus too much today. Not really, but like, right? Like, <laughs> trying, trying to understand, or people trying to tell me, right, that I, that I could not in those same spaces. And yet, I had not done any of this to myself. And I said, how does this happen, right? How is it that I would continue to walk across my campus every day and feel this, this in essence, this imposter syndrome that exists so heavily and not be able to give name, place, or credence as to how it was or why it was that I was experiencing those things in my body in very real and lived ways, right? Y'all still with me? Um, and so even in that same capacity, what happened for me, I think, when we begin to talk about imposter syndrome, you have to think about what the real effects are for students that are navigating spaces on college campuses that are being forced to reconcile with their identities at any given moment. And so this happens, we see this like, when you bring people together that have never interacted with other spheres. And we do this on a very basic level. We say, oh, well, you know, that's a part of the learning process. And oh, there are things. What I argue is that there are very systemic ways in which the institution has been strategically set up so that that imposter syndrome would be something that is continually perpetuated and felt. And so I argue that the place that that begins and that that starts from in terms of respectability begins with this notion that the university is seen as an extension of the business before it is an actual academic accredited and merited space for higher education. And so, you know, like the energy was just like, I know, right? It was heavy. But let's be honest about that very real reality. Because for as long, we have to interrogate how it is that we would come into spaces of higher education day after day, proclaim that this is the space of all things learning. I'm not talking about, maybe it's not WPI, other spaces, right? right? But you would come into spaces, find yourself around them, enmeshed within them 24 seven, right? And you're talking about gaining this educational attainment, you're talking about career advancement, all of these notions, and yet, still at the end of the day, though, you are finding that your basic right to exist is being called into question almost at every juncture. And then what then are you left and made to do with that? Well, I'd say honestly, right, that it is for the institution. The institution has been strategically designed so that those feelings would be felt. And it starts with the merit and from the place. And again, I'm a proponent for higher education. Let me say that again, right? <laughs> I'm here, we're doing this, right? I, I live and breathe this space. But I can also be critical of the ways in which we come into the space and how it is that we continue to find ourselves in these spaces and yet being frustrated about the fact that we're like, where is the real systemic change occurring? And how is it or how is it not occurring, right? And so this is no this. I also say this again as a, as, as a higher education administrator myself. Right, who's asking the same things of not only myself, but also my students as well. I'm getting hot, y'all, I'm getting so hot. <laughs> I'm getting hot in this room, good. Okay, let me pause there for a moment. I will come back, I will come back to, to one of those other pieces. Okay, and so, the space of higher education absolutely needs reform, and we know this. We know this, we have felt this, we live this, we breathe this. That imposter syndrome that students feel is something that I think it does not have to exist in the same ways that it always does. I argue that there are also other spaces that exist as well within the institution where that, that aids to that feeling or that demographic of that imposter syndrome. One of those being, I know here at WPI, I do a lot of STEM work, right? 
And so what I would say is that when I was coming into my, my college experience, I was for the longest amount of time, I was like, I'm gonna be a doctor, this is gonna be a thing, you know, it's gonna happen, it's gonna be excellent, I was in the medical program before, all the things. I didn't become a doctor, not because I was smart enough, because I just actually like, I like medicine, but I didn't love medicine. So that was for me. But systemically, we also have to think about the ways in which students are navigating spaces, especially in STEM fields, and what that advising can look like. Because respectability rears its ugly head at every juncture and every moment, whether that's racially based, whether it's about your LGBTQ identity or status, but we place expectations upon people or we don't place expectations upon certain bodies with the realization thinking that they will not be able to matriculate through those spaces, right? And so what does the advising structure look like, especially when it comes to our students of color, especially when it comes to our first generation initiative students, right? I said first generation initiative, that's the program I run. First gen students, right? <laughs> everybody into the space with me today. But also, what does that feel like in those very same ways? I argue that the respectability that many of different bodies encompass, especially when we're talking about first-gen populations, is different than any other holistic interpretation that we've seen before. And one of those starts, I say this as a first-gen student myself, one of the greatest barriers that I felt like I contended with was not only this notion of the imposter syndrome that I felt on my campus that we know students are experiencing across a variety of spaces throughout higher education, but it was the self-internalization that came with the pressure that was on my back to be one of the first in my family to do it. So there it is that that, that respectability already exists over here, right? Got to be the first, got to get it all together. But then there was this other notion that came alongside that too that said, the only narrative that many of my parents or family members have heard is that it would have to be completed in four years. And I don't know if y'all have thought about that, right? But what we know about first-gen students in particular, also just nationwide, across the nation statistically, is that there is a greater reported, that's the word that I want to use, there's a greater reported self-doubt that occurs, not from the act of not being able to complete the degree, but being able to complete the degree in the four years that was allotted, because that is the narrative that we hear most often throughout our time in higher education. And the reality is, and I do this work for the students and personal use, medical use, things like that, what we know is that that four-year trajectory is becoming a notion that is becoming less and less, but it's still one that the university wants to talk about more and more. How is it that we hold both of those things in juxtaposition? All right? I don't have any long time. Oh my goodness, it's a long time in there. Okay, moving on. We also need to think about going back to the notion about intersectionality and black feminisms, right? That work, the work of intersectionality comes out of black feminist scholars, right? We can go back to Pamela Collins, Kimberly Crenshaw, those that were doing that in both second and third wave, really. Um, and one of the things we have to interrogate on the notion of intersectionality as well is what does respectability sound like, right? So like we, we have this notion, we've got this, we already, we've got this definition here. We're like, okay, I see it in these moments. I could be X identity and experiencing this. But how does it show up, especially within higher education, right? And so I started paying attention. And, and the reason that I began asking this question is because I felt like there were expectations that were placed upon my body that I was not made aware of. Yet, I was assumed to need to and have to know in order to do not only my job, but also in order to obtain my degree. And I said, how is it that somebody would not tell me these things, right? Like, like that just, just, but that is what respectability does, right? Because it forces you into a space where you may not be cognizant of what is being placed upon you until you start reaping, right, the very ill effects of that same conversation. I can't say that again, even if I wanted to, so I'm glad I said it. Sometimes the spirit moves you, you just got to work with it. And so it sounds like professionalism. I hate the word, y'all. I hate it so much. I, I hate, as I tap the side of this podium, right? I hate the notion of professionalism, and I'll tell you why. Because the notion of professionalism comes out of colonial context, number one. And it is nothing other than, I wish that you could and would act more white. And here it is where it begins. The institution of higher education was not made for me. It was not made for women. It was not in its design, right? In its historical design. It was not made for queer identified bodies. It was not made for dis 
abled bodies or differently abled bodies. It was not made for international student-based bodies, right? And so now when we see that our field of higher education is truly encompassing, we are the greatest parts of all of those pieces within our intersectional frames and identities, but it also should not be to us that we become the symbol or the marker of that diversity, right? We aid in the ability of the university to be able to move through that, but inherently, we are not here simply as a marker of that diversity. But respectability tries to tell us that we are. And so professionalism is what it, it, it begins to sound like. It's also wrapped up in the notion of the word proper. Anytime I hear the word proper, I'm like, oh, what does that mean? Right? My body wants to like move crooked in it. Like, <laughs> I, don't, I don't know what that, what, that, what that means other than there is something that you have given me reason to think that whatever I have done has not lived up to an expectation that you once carried. Right? And that becomes complicated by my race, that becomes complicated by my class status, that becomes complicated by my, the history of my mother being a southern black woman, right? It becomes complicated by all of these narratives that continue to move me through even in those same spaces. When I hear words like systematic, or words like fit, right? These are other notions that begin to carry the same, same contingencies with respectability politics but it's never said to you in that way. It's always like it's always meant to be like so sweet, like, oh, your professionalism is so excellent. Like who says that, right? <laughs> but sometimes folks will, and they and, and they do, but usually it's not to folks that look like me, or maybe not you. And so moving through that, I think, I know I gotta wrap up because I have like gotta leave some time for some quick questions, and this is just the start of our conversation. One other thing that I will throw to you, two other things, two last things. When we, when we begin the conversation with staff and faculty, as I know there are some staff and faculty in the room here today, respectability begins to rear its ugly head when we see lack of promotion and tenure, which limits the upward mobility. So your employer or your boss is not going to say to you, oh, you're just too black for my liking. I'm not going to give you tenure, right? Like that, that's never gets said to you. But it is couched in ways that begin to describe the way in which you move through the world, right? It might say, oh, again, your emails are not professional enough. What does that mean? It means there's a particular vernacular that I wish that you would speak in. So me getting up here and being like, yo, what's good, y'all, may not work so well, right? <laughs> But also, we do want it to help respectability, right? You know what I mean? Like, push that thing over there and push it to the side. It also shows up in ways when we talk about this notion of code switching, right? And it happens not only for students of color, but I think code switching is something that is applicable to different identities in different ways. We might call it something else. But it is, it, again, it's this, this extreme negotiation of identity in the same ways to have to ascribe to what is would be considered a more elitist or a more white way, vernacular way of speaking, being, talking. Anything that you can imagine that you can point your fist or your finger to is the way that you are expected to show up in spaces. The last thing that I'll say around faculty and staff as well is this notion of time and how time is spent. Students, actually, I think it's, I think, I think it's for the students as well, so it's for everybody in this room. This notion of time. Um, in our American society here, we do not do well with rest. We do not do well with self-care. We talk about it, especially in the academy, the same way I'm about to sit here and talk to you about it right now, knowing good and well, knowing good and well that I did not get enough sleep last night. But you know what, right? But let's be honest about the very, very real effects of what that begins to look like when we move to those spaces in the same ways. And so, as a black body, but also, <laughs> I'll, I'll put it like this, we feel the need to be busier than everyone around, me, around us, and as, as a black body, just so that I do not appear to be lazy, but what happens when my ability or my body does not allow me to do so? And so I ran up against this. I have been in situations where folks have questioned my ability um, or have looked at my calendars and said, have praised me for the fact that I am as busy as I am. And I was like, I don't want to be praised for that thing. And I realized, I started like looking at my calendar and like filling in times so that I you know, would have meetings. I, I'm meeting with students all day. That's what we do, right? You get there to work. But I also realized there was a gaze that was associated with that so that others around me, in particular my white colleagues, would feel better about telling me, oh, Drea, I see how busy you are at every juncture. Therefore, I know that you're doing your work. But the minute that I had to take a step back, right, because I made myself sick in so many ways, right, working too much, too hard, too long, too fast, 
all of these pieces, thinking that I needed to save the institution that was over here only at the end of the day working for my, still for my, my greater oppression, it became a moment where I had to pull back and say, I need support in a different way. And it wasn't received all that well, y'all. Right? That moment of that intersection. So my black body needed to be over here, be out here and be busy. So I didn't ascribe to your respectability politic of not being lazy, right? And then the thing is, though, my body actually would not allow me to move to that space because my ability status said otherwise and different for that time being. And at that moment, I found myself still at that same crossroads where no matter how busy I was before, it did not help me in the moment when I needed it to. And so that leads me to the last thing that I will offer to you all in just this short amount of time, which is the internalization of respectability politics. And so on a very spiritual level, and I'm a spiritual person, y'all, not, not religious, but spiritual. Um, I believe in a higher power. I believe that God is a woman. Any feminists? Okay. All right. That's fine. Um, Spiritual distress is a very real thing, and many of us are in it each and every moment of the day and don't realize it because we don't have language for it, number one, or we don't understand how it is that we got here until we are already within a place where we have to sit down. And so the internalization of the stereotypes, right, because you can't talk about respectability without talking about stereotypes, also lends to things greater in our need for understanding depression, anxiety, and the very real effects that it had and that it takes on your body. As higher education professionals, for those of us that are professionals in the room, and I say this with students in the space very specifically and poignantly, you can be mad at me later if you need to, but as higher education professionals, we do a very poor job of modeling for our students what actual self-care is, should be, and how it is to look. And I started pushing back because my students actually started holding me more accountable than I was holding myself. When they said, Drea, how is it that you're still here? It's seven and eight o'clock and you're here all the time. You're running us to, you know, going to the hospital for different various things, right? Like all sorts of stuff. And they said, you, you all the time, Drea. You're the, you're the main person who tells us to, to pull back and yet you don't. And our students don't like it when I tell them why I was doing self-care. That's why I didn't answer your email. But, <laughs> But I'm also, I'm also not afraid to say it, right? Because what we do is we allow these respectability politics to internally move us to a place where we are then not able to model, not even for our own selves or our students, but we set up unhealthy expectations for our students that are going to be our future leaders as we move through the world as well. And I think we absolutely have to interrogate how respectability is played upon our bodies in that same way. The last thing that I think I can offer when we think about transformation, and then hopefully we might have two seconds for two questions, I hope so. When we offer a moment for transformation and thinking about transformation, we can look at ratchet feminism. Not sure if y'all know what that is. Some of y'all do. If you don't, look it up. But ratchet feminism is the guys, essentially, it is a pushback entirely against respectability politics, especially in the narrative when it comes to black women in particular. And what ratchet feminism says is that I will reclaim this notion of the word ratchet, right, that has been denigrated to black women to call them anything, anything sexual that you potentially can, but also with notions of being ghetto, right, of also not having enough means, right, these notions of welfare queens, right, like all of these old historical um, symbolic entries that we see black women have contended with. And it pushes back on that and it says, I embrace not only all of that, but also my ability to proclaim ratchetness within my feminist work. And it is trans, it is phenomenal. I, I wish I could identify as ratchet feminist, but I don't think I'm ratchet enough for it. So I'm, I'm working on it. We also, see, we also see the transformation in Black Lives Matter movement, right? As a direct call and response to respectability. When black women got up and said, oh no, right? We will not stand by and watch the, you know, the killings of black bodies, in particular black and brown women and men and young people, right, that would continue to happen without being able to push back and speak back to those things. And so when we think about how it is that we're gonna resist, I think we have to do some naming, right? Folks don't know all the time that they're placing respectability politics upon you. And so it does carry, it doesn't force you to have to be the bearer of, of that situation. I've been in many situations where I've called folks out and folks that were not happy that I called them out and I said, what you did right now, what you did right here was, was actually not well. But I also say the naming is important, but also you need to make to ensure that you have protection in spaces. 
And if you're going to do that naming, and if you know spaces are not well for you, to ensure that you have a protection system that is ensured around you, so that if you are going to do that naming, the repercussions are not only left or felt by, I think I'm right now. The repercussions are not only felt by you, right? But they're also visible to somebody else. Because that's what, that's what accountability within respectability, that's what it has to look like. And lastly, let's see higher education as the space that can be moved from this corporate business model. The further that we get from that, I think the more transformative we can be. And so lastly, I keep saying to y'all, I know I'm lying. We return, we return to our quote from once where we started, right? Our deepest fear is not that we are inadequate. Our deepest fear is that we are powerful beyond measure. It is our light, not our darkness, that most frightens us because we ask ourselves, who am I to be brilliant, gorgeous, talented, and fabulous? Actually, who are you not to be? You are a child of God. Your playing small does not serve the world. There is nothing enlightened about shrinking so that other people won't feel insecure around you. We are all meant to shine as children do. We were born to make manifest the glory of God that is within us. It's not just in some of us, it's in everyone. And as we let our own light shine, we unconsciously give other people permission to do the same. And we are liberated from our own fear. Our presence automatically liberates others. Thank you all so much. to do that work, which is why I say the more folks that are aware of it, it's so refreshing to see a room 
you know, that was full in the way that it was today to just even come to understand in some ways what respectability can look like and how it is that we enact that. Did I answer your question? I hope so. <laughs> Other thoughts, questions, things I can answer? Yeah. Can you talk about some of the ways in which like students that you've worked with, whether they're first gen or other students, have also pushed back against some of the like, respectability that's being discussed on the college campus? Yeah, absolutely. So my <laughs> many of my students um, are like movers and shakers, and like the minute that they learn a new term in, in social justice, they are like, "This happened to me, right?" Like, you know, and, and I'm like, "Yes, it did. Of course, it did happen because we know that those are very real experiences." But one, it's about staying well read. I really, I really like genuinely as scholarly folk, like we do need to be very abreast of, of what is happening in our fields, understanding how it is that we've gone through that. But also, you have to identify safe spaces and safe people. And so I have been, you know, I have positioned myself as a person for whom I believe many students know that they can come to and have conversations like this. But it's not, it doesn't stop at the moment of just having the conversation. We also have to help students be equipped to be able to respond, right, when respectability politics are being placed at not only their feet, but also our feet in the same way. Because it's one thing to do the naming. Right, but if you cannot move beyond that naming to say how it is that that naming has lined up to my direct job action title and why it is that I deserve a raise because I do, right? Like, if you can't do those things, it becomes very, it becomes null and void in a lot of ways because your ability to transgress that space, right, has stopped at the moment of doing that naming. And so, back to your question, I think um, my work with students is really a holistic. It's a really holistic space, one that there can be self-advocacy on their parts on their behalf, but also to continue to challenge the institution, right? EGP processes, right, we're moving through Title IX grievances, things like that. Like, yes, you can follow administrative pathways forward, and I always believe that you should, but there's also moments where sometimes, even within those processes, people still need to be checked as well, too, right? And so, like, we are still under the mercies of other folks. And so I think it's a matter of working with students to really help identify and say, if one person has gotten it wrong, that doesn't mean that others won't, right? How then can we move forward in those spaces? But I also just encourage them, I think, from a, real, from a very real space of speaking their truth at every juncture, at every moment and point of the way. Because what respectability does is it, it's a silencing factor, right? It wants you to be quiet, it wants you to go into that space so that you do that self-internalizing. And then you do the internalizing to the place where you can't name how it is that you got to that place to begin with. Right? It's insidious in its nature. That's what I wanted to say before. It's insidious. <laughs> but it's extremely insidious sometimes, and it's covert and it's coded. So helping students really to understand um, what those subtleties look like, right, really helps in their ability to not only empower themselves but to kind of move forward in that way. Can I ask you a question? Yeah. How do you do that though, yeah. and still help them understand that they have to do this? <laughs> oh, <it's all> <laughs> And and tell them like you know, dudes, like 
Yeah, so I'm still working on it, to be quite honest, <laughs> right? And, and that is my honest answer because that is probably the, the most, the point that I feel the most tension within, within my career at this moment in time, right? And it is one, being able to respond to students and be there as that voice, because that's really what I want to be, that's who I am, that is where my heart is, that's, that's, that's just kind of my, my spirit is, is in that way, in that person. Um, just the same way, I also have a program that I run, and I also have a caseload of 500 plus students, right? And so there are always other things that have to get done and have to be managed. And it was posited to me um, by someone in a position of power over me and said, in so many ways, well, maybe you just can't handle it, right? As if, as if it was about me. And that's when I had to turn around and say, again, we have to go back to the structure, right, of higher education that has been enacted in this way because there are changes that could be made so that the work doesn't have to feel the way that it does. For some reason, I think there is a way that the institution has made us believe that the way that it is currently functioning is the only way that it can. And that is an absolute lie, right? And we have to be willing, we have to be willing to restructure, reorganize, and actually speak to the people that we are making decisions over, right? If you are in a position of power, to understand what that realm looks like. Because I think there's a perception in, in higher administration as well that a lot of the work that we think we need to be doing isn't actually the work that needs to be done and actually doesn't get to the issues that actually need to be addressed at hand. A lot of the work that we end up doing goes back to that corporate business model so that we can cross T's dot I's and yet we forget students in the process. And so I think I made somebody upset. It's okay. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, you know, it, it, but in all honesty, I have I had to advocate for myself in those ways. But I won't lie to you and say that I still don't feel that tension because I do. And so also as a black woman, right, it is perceived that I would be somebody that is going to do more emotional labor within the university than anybody else anyways. And so when that is already a part of your job title and description, right, it becomes very tricky to negotiate those spaces. And so I continue talking. I mean, eventually, I just continue to talk. <laughs> it's the best thing that I can say. Um, I don't know if I answered your question, but all I can say is that there's, there's, there's a very real tension that exists there. We have to be honest about that, but we also need to be very, very clear to the higher powers that be of what the work actually entails with students and what it means to do this work on the ground and not just in theory or in job description or in title. Well, thank y'all so much. It's really been a pleasure to be here and uh, bring it back in the parts of y'all. <laughs>